Hello, my name's Robin Muller. I work for Campaspe Shire Council. I've worked in local government for 20 years, but I have 40 years experience in civil engineering. I've worked in development design. I've worked in site set out. I currently work in a role where I look after all of our footpaths, our curb ramps and public infrastructure. I have a personal passion for universal access and ensuring that all members of our community can make their way through our community and fulfil their lives. I'm an accredited access auditor and I use these skills directly in ensuring that these things happen every day in everything that we do. Today we have some members of our community to help out with making this video. It's great to see them out helping us because it helps make their lives better and it helps teach all of the people who are using the IDM and engineers the importance of making it better for the community. I'd like to thank them for coming along and help us today because it really demonstrates that this is a people problem, not a maths problem. Today on this video we're going to talk about curb ramps, we're going to talk about grades, we're going to talk about the locations where you put them so that they're usable, the usability for, for all user groups and we're going to talk about TGSIs, Tactile Ground Surface Indicators. So for all of our work the overarching principle is the difference between universal design and minimum access compliance. There is a vast difference between providing access to buildings and facilities based on minimum compliance requirements of disability access legislation and ensuring that these spaces can be used by everyone. Whilst minimum compliance is necessary to meet legislative requirements, it is critical to consider the principles of universal design in order to maximise outcomes for all users and to future-proof buildings, footpaths and facilities for generations to come. So what we need to think about when we're doing design, what we always need to think about is who needs curb ramps? And the answer is not disabled people. There's a whole lot of user groups. There's wheelchairs with big wheels, electric wheelchairs with small wheels, frames with tiny wheels, personal mobility aids, which are the granny scooters, prams and pushers, children under 12 who are allowed to ride on footpaths, people who are frail and cannot lift their leg or foot easily without loss of balance, people with vision impairments, people who are walking along texting and not looking where they're going. Everyone, universal access is for everyone. So when we're looking at good curb ramp design, there's a whole lot of objectives we need to consider. So we need to consider that it's a smooth grade up and down for users traveling both directions on a curb ramp. They need to direct users straight across the roadway to a continuous path of travel on the other side. They need to have a smooth transition between the surfaces and the grades. And they cannot trap users on the roadway unable to progress due to a bullnose, a trough or a steep exit. They need to provide sufficient clear warning of hazards ahead and they need to be readable by users. Good curb ramps can eliminate the need for TGSIs in many situations. As Jason comes along the path and he comes to the concrete part, you can see the inclusive angle there is such that his foot plate sticks and his small wheels get stuck in the tray. He then has to really give it an oomph to get himself across the road. The road is quite graded and so that's, that's not helping and at this side again the inclusive angle gets him and he's stuck by the foot plate and the small wheels. He has to give a big push to get through that, then come up Ideally there should be a rest stop at 1.5 so that he can let go his wheels, get another grip and push himself the west of the way up the slope. This is an example where the inclusive angle and the grade without a rest stop makes it very difficult to cross. We've set up two levels to show the grade through the invert and this is 11.1 .1 degrees and this is 5.7 degrees. So 
because it has to be 166 as the inclusive angle, then 14 degrees is what you're looking at between the two outside angles. So this is only 116, 117 degrees. So it's only two or three degrees too steep. And you saw what an impact it had on Jason's day. So don't be looking to design at the max because you're already making it difficult for users. So you need to be considering the road grade and also the path grade. Then as we move up here, this path should have 1.52 metres at one in eight as a maximum grade, which is one big push for Jason with his wheel. It's one push, one wheel turn should get him up to about here, which is about 1.5 from the invert. Then there should be a landing, a flat spot in the path so that he can have a rest, he can reposition his hands and he can push again because as you can see there's quite a long grade that he then needs to get up to get up onto the flat part of the path. And here's another example of a bad kerb ramp. This is reasonably recent work. Um, the kerb and channel's been poured with a kerb and channel machine and then they've manually knocked out the back of kerb here and had a bit of a go of getting a grade through here to here. But as you can see, it's not the same grade from here to here as it is up here. So if I go like that, that's that grade, and then it flattens out. So on the design plans, the invert level would have been correct. The point at 1.52 would be correct, but because of this poor workmanship, you still don't get the one in eight grade that you need for manual users to push up it, or the tactual message for people to know to come down it that they're coming to a road. So it's very important when, when there's people doing this that they understand that they've got to get that grade, that point and that point on one grade. So this is also, after this point, there isn't a landing, there isn't a flat landing for someone to have a rest and reposition themselves to keep going. And it's actually a very good example of poor scope of works where because they were too scungy to take out enough squares of footpath, they've tried to match into this point. This should have been flatter, probably three more squares should have gone and it should have been a landing and then graded back gently to link into the footpath and away up the street. And another thing we can point out here that this is new work and a footpath, but once you go over the road, the lack of scope of works has not continued the path of travel for someone. So someone ends up here, where do they go? And here we are at a location where we have a good curb ramp, nice transition, 1.52, nice flat landing, coming onto a long path. But then the long path has a big dip in it where they've brought the path down to accommodate this crossing point. Keep going, please, sweet. Um, then what? there's no controls in this area at all that say that you'd have to have a grade like this, excepting the code says one in 14 max. So someone's designed one in 14 max and then gone to dead flat. By transitioning it over a much longer distance, you could have had a smooth, gentle grade through here with no discernible change. It would be much more aesthetically pleasing and it would give a much nicer path of travel for people traveling along the path. The thing to think about here is the whole design concept in a greenfield site where if you start from the invert of the curb, do your grade, do your landing, do another grade if you have to, but then the path height all through here could be much lower and all it would impact would be the first metre of fill on this site. But it's not, it's not a control, it's just dirt. The controls are the road, the invert, the necessary grades on this and then the path. The dirt's the dirt, it can change level and as soon as they put trucks on that to construct something, it'll be all over the place. People will then landscape it and it'll come back to match into the path levels that you get. So the big tip is to design from the invert up. There's a number of tools we can use in designing curb ramps. For good rudimentary in information, the IDM Standard Drawings 200 and Standard Drawing 270 
provide good base information. For more detailed information, you can move to the Australian Standards 1428 Part 1 for general information and 1428 Part 4 for masses of technical detail on TGSIs. Access Audits Australia have publications that cover off on wider issues around access to the built environment and also have very good question and answer sheet type information. We're here today now with Ewan and Ewan's going to show us using this good um, well constructed curb ramp. Ewan would you like to roll there through there for us? Off you go. So Ewan can do that quite well by himself because it has nice grades, it has the, the dip in the bottom without too big a slope in the, on the sides and he can do that easily. He could come back and show us again if we're lucky. Um, so then it comes up the 1.52 and then it has a very flat landing so that then he can change directions, have a rest, get ready to change directions and go this way. So he's going to come back through. And you can see that he can do that quite easily. Okay, we can move on here to a, a bad one. So Ewan goes down this one and it's quite a clunky thing and it also throws him crooked because of the angle of the curb and channel. And as you can see, that one's quite hard work and he gets a bit stuck with his little steady wheel on the back, but he's doing a good job. And back again. You can see how the angle of the curve is throwing him crooked. And there he goes again. So it's a, it's a bigger push up the road for him. And a bigger push on the other side because again there's not a landing at the other side to help him out. And it's important for Ewan that these are well set out because Ewan wants to be an independent user and get on with his life and not be bothered by these things holding him up. So we'll work on making them better for him everywhere we go. So what we're looking at there is examples of different ways for Ewan to cross the road and different curb ramps. You can see that the good ones make it simple, they're smooth, they're easy to work. That the less good ones and the bad ones make it more difficult for him. They, they tip him crooked. He has to push harder. It just makes his everyday life more difficult. We need to overcome this through good design. Here we are at another location showing a good curb ramp. You can see this curb ramp here has a very gentle grade through the invert of the curb and channel. Nicely continued on from this point through the invert and up the 1.5 metres at the same grade all the way along. So easy to push up. Um, then there's this very good landing here where it's flat and it's even. So someone coming up this path can come to this point and either turn to use that path that way, have a rest and keep going. The slope keeps coming up after that but soft even slope with no sharp transitions to a point here on the top where they can turn and go back down onto the other path. This is a good example of a curb ramp that would be easy for people to negotiate as they're getting around. The other thing we notice here is that the displays on this curb ramp are narrow. The pictures in the IDM show them out at 45 degrees. And although that, that slope at 45 degrees is very helpful when people are coming across hard stand material to approach the curb ramp, here where there's not a path that you'd be coming across, you wouldn't be coming across the loose stones and you wouldn't be coming across the grass here, it's quite fine for them to be narrow. The direction's correct, people are pushed onto the ramp correctly and it works just fine for an area where there's not hard stand surrounding it. Back in the CBD, hard stand all around, definitely need wide splays. Here in a residential area, less crucial. So TGSIs come in two types. There's the ones with the 
dots on and the indicator that they give to users is of danger or of a point of interest. So in this case here, someone who comes across this TGSI pad here will know that there's something interesting happening here. There's a change of direction. They have to choose to go that way across the road or they have to choose to go this way across the road. The long stripy ones are directional TGSIs and people will use those to keep straight as they're making their way through open areas of concrete um, and it'll lead them directly to the next point of interest for them. So as we move down here to this set of tactiles here, this is tactiles that indicate either a danger or something of interest. A user will stop here and have a little think and a feel around and they'll go, oh, that's a curb ramp. And they might even tap as far forward as this and say, it's a road. They'll stop and they'll use this place to stand to judge that they're safe while they, they work on all the other things they know about crossing the road. So in the standard, it says that that should be 300 mil back from the invert. But you can see in this circumstance here, they're a little bit further back because they've crashed into the curb construction. It's probably more important if you have to adjust the distance that they move back so the user's safe when they're standing on it than you move them too far forward where they'd be exposed to the risk of the traffic. So once they've got here and got settled and they're satisfied that they can cross the road, then they'll make their way across the road. All right, I'm shorelining along the grass using the sweeping left to right method of the cane. It ends up being a tick-tock method, which is when you're tapping left and right, following the grass. I'm walking in a straight line, still shorelining, oh, all right. Uh, that's the noise of me hitting the tactiles. There's two separate noises. All right, now I'm still walking in a straight line. Now you hear the... Right, and there's the round tactiles, the dots, telling me that there's a crossing. You notice the difference in noise. All right, I'm gonna make sure it's safe to cross. Don't want me getting run over on video. All right, safe to cross. And I've come to the middle part of the road, more tactiles in the safety area. Now, making sure I'm safe again. All right, I think I'm safe. Yep. And I'm walking, and I'm walking, I'm walking. Oh, I went offline, as that's common. And I'm now safely across the road. On that example, when I walked onto the road, I was walking in a generally straight line. And when I got to the other side, I went off on an angle because there's no markers, there's no like lines to walk between. When using TGSIs, you have to be careful not to think that they need to go everywhere all, all the time. They're not icing, they have a function and they only need to be where they function. So in this circumstance here, where the grass edge of the path is a really good indicator of how where you're going and then you come to the hazard marker here you don't actually need you need a couple to send you in this direction but you don't actually need all of those ones because you still have the path edges to lead you to where you're going in a big sea of concrete in another application you will need the continuous runs of markers but you have to think about where you're using them and think about why they just become street clutter. When retrofitting TGSIs into an existing environment where they've come along here to the building face and the ideal position for this directional pad is here, but there's already existing infrastructure, it's been moved to here, which is, doesn't give anyone who's shorelining their way along the building any indication of what they're going to hit. There should be another strip of directionals coming all the way across. So when they're coming through, they pick up those directionals, make their way to the 
to these ones and then they can choose where they're going. It works the same in reverse when they're coming back across the street. So although it's difficult in retrofitting stuff, it's better to make sure you've covered everyone's path of travel than you go, oh, we'll just move it over a bit because moving it over a bit's not the solution. When thinking about TGSIs, they come in various materials and as a good guide, Vic Roads puts out design notes for approved TGSIs. We'd recommend that you only use v Vic Roads approved TGSIs. There are lots of types on the market, but if you stay with the ceramics and the tack paved ones, you'll have good life. So when we undertake curb ramp design, we should always be thinking about the people. We should be thinking about the usability of what we're putting down made out of concrete that's going to last for 50 years. We need to ensure that the outcomes are for the benefits of our communities. Mm -hmm.